So we need to talk about UK constitutional reform or further UK constitutional reform. And what does that mean? Over the last few videos or over the last uh, few weeks when you've been looking at your textbooks, you've been learning about all the constitutional changes that have taken place since 1997, whether it's devolution, the Supreme Court, the, uh, the House of Lords. And what we're going to be doing in this video is saying, well, which of these have been a success? Which of these have been a partial success? Which of these have been an, a, a complete failure? And also, where will further reform take place in the future? For example, such as will there be voting age um, lowered to 16 or, or things like that. I'm just going to double check that this is all recording correctly. It is. There you go. It'll, you can go into the, uh, um, the looking glass of Alice in Wonderland there just for a second. So as always, this video is an introduction to these topics and you can get further reading on the page numbers here. However, UK Revision Note 75 um, is okay uh, for codified constitutions, but it doesn't include all the rest. So you definitely need to do the additional reading um, for this particular topic um, as well as your own kind of research. So the big further constitutional reform that we need to deal with straight away is Brexit. It's, it's big, it's huge, it's unknown, and it's happening right now. It's the 1st of October on the day I've recorded this, and in theory, we leave the EU by the end of this month. Who knows if we will? Um, that's down to Boris and Parliament and all, all those kind of things. Um, but we are sitting right in the middle of constitutional change, and that would be exciting if we hadn't have been sitting in the middle of constitutional change for the last kind of four or five years. Um, but it seemed a lot more immediate at the moment. Now, why is Brexit a constitutional question? So the constitution is how the country is, is run, the rules that, that dictate how our decisions are made and how we're governed and all those kind of things. And when we joined the EU in the 1970s, we pooled our sovereignty, key phrase, pooled sovereignty, that which means us and a group of other countries all got together and we said, right, we're going to agree that any laws made by the EU and any rulings made by the EU courts, we are going to obey, we are going to follow. So we pooled our sovereignty upwards. Parliament is sovereign, but actually we voluntarily said that although Parliament is sovereign in the UK, we're going to allow the EU to have sovereignty over us on, on a temporary basis, as it, as it turns out. Now, the EU courts one, in particular, has proved pretty controversial because the U, any ruling made by an EU court overrules a ruling made by the UK court. So, if you had gone to the to the court for something and you didn't like it, you could appeal it and you could go to, say, the High Court. You could appeal it and go maybe to the Supreme Court if they would take your case. And then you could appeal it again and go to the EU courts, um, which led to a situation where the EU court could overrule UK courts. And uh, one of the, the, the most um, kind of passionate Brexit arguments was about taking back control. And this idea of EU, uh, this idea of, of legal sovereignty um, was something that was very important to a lot of people. The EU laws, the EU has created a lot of laws. In fact, they, they prefer to use the term regulations, a lot of regulations on huge amounts of things, such as fishing and food, and et cetera, et cetera, that we have had to follow. And many of these have been beneficial, but they continue to be EU laws that we have chosen to follow rather than UK laws, which are part of our own statute. So when we leave the EU, if we leave the EU, put your own um, pronoun in there, which you want, I'm not even sure that's a pronoun, but anyway, um, this is going to be a big difference because all of a sudden all these EU laws are going to disappear and all these judgments by EU courts, in theory, will, will disappear. So constitutionally, how do we deal with that? So there have been two withdrawal acts that have been passed by our UK Parliament. The first one was by uh, Theresa May and the second one was just a few weeks ago. So let's have a little look at them. The first EU Withdrawal Act, follow the, um, the, the top link that I've put on that PowerPoint if you'd like to read this in more detail. But this was announced by Theresa May and it was done um, in 2017 and it did three things. First of all, it repealed the European Communities Act 1972. So it removes our joining of the EU. The second one is this, and I hope this is appearing on the screen. Yes, it is. The second one is it brings all the EU laws onto the UK book. So it takes everything that was in the EU and brings it all together, bump, straight 
onto the UK statute. And the argument is, is that we could spend ages going this one, not this one, this one, not this one, this one, not this one, but then leaving the EU would take years. Ha, ha, ha. Um, and the idea was if you bring them all in in one go, then nothing changes. All businesses have to follow the same regulations or people have to follow the same regulations. And then over the coming years and decades, you can remove and adjust and change. So there's a, there's, there's a bit of kind of common sense there. And thirdly, it also gave ministers power to make secondary legislation, which is something we'll talk about more uh, when we get to the legislature. But it, it essentially means that ministers have the power to make kind of tweaks to the laws. But let, let, let's talk about that one another time. And that one sat there relatively happily uh, for the last couple of years. But then we've got to the European Withdrawal Act number two, which um, is sometimes named the, the Ben Bill after... Uh, Hilary Benn, who's a, a Labour MP in the House of Commons, and um, Boris Johnson has recently called this the Surrender Bill or the, the Humiliation Bill. Ah, now do you know what I'm talking about? This was the one that was passed just before Parliament was prorogued or suspended. Spoiler, it never was. Um, and it says that Bo if Boris doesn't have a deal or if the Prime Minister doesn't have a deal, then he has to ask for an extension. So it's restricting what the prime minister can and cannot do. And it's guaranteeing in theory that he has to go and ask for a, uh, an extension rather than getting what's called a no deal Brexit. Um, and again, that's a constitutional change because it's limiting and adjusting the powers of the prime minister. And a constitution is all about separation of powers and powers of the legislature and powers of the, the kind of prime minister. So even just this act by itself is a, a constitutional change. Now, I'm not going not to pretend in this video to know where we're going and what's happening and what's a permanent constitutional change and what's not, but this is certainly something that you should be talking about in an essay on further constitutional change um, or, or to what extent constitutional change has been successful. Um, because if Boris gets round the Withdrawal Act number two, then it's been an unsuccessful constitutional change. Or you could argue that leaving the EU has been a successful constitutional change because he has made it happen. I mean, you can kind of twist the arguments as you want, but these are beautiful and wonderful and perfect examples, um, meaty examples of, as well, that you can be talking about um, in your um, exams. So now let's speed up a bit and start to look more in general at what constitutional changes have been have been successes and partial and failures. I'm not going to talk in, in detail on loads of these because we've talked about most of them before on previous videos or in the textbooks. I'm more going to give you broad brush headlines to mix metaphors perfectly. So first of all, the Supreme Court. Supreme Court was created. Uh, we're talking 2008, I think. It was the when that was when the was it 2005? It was. Passed and then it started in 2008. Check my dates. I'm looking desperately for my posters around the room. But it's somewhere around that period. And the Supreme Court was created above um, the existing High Court and it was physically moved out of the House of Lords into its own new building. And over the, over the next kind of 10 years, it has become more and more independent. It's become more and more powerful. It's become more and more respected and perhaps culminating in the ruling that we saw just two weeks ago where Lady Hale overruled the proroguing of Parliament and stood up for, I guess, kind of democracy and the rule of law um, against the Prime Minister. And I think although people have disagreed perhaps with some of the rulings the Supreme Court has made, it has generally been seen as a huge success that we now have this independent judiciary that can protect citizens' rights and can try and clarify um, blurred edges to our constitution, and it's generally been seen as a good thing. Um, devolution has also been a huge success. Um, we have the, these, these three assemblies in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. We now have the London Mayor, we now have additional mayors and assemblies again in London and Birmingham and Liverpool um, the, the, and, and increasing powers have been given out to these institutions. So this, this has really worked well in many cases um, and given a, a greater degree of independence and access points and uh, democratic locality, that's probably not a good phrase, um, to, to certain areas. Another one that we haven't talked about yet, um, but I do need to go back and make a video about, was is something called the Freedom of Information Act. This was one of um, uh, Tony Blair's uh, constitutional reforms, which is the idea that the government shouldn't be able to hide certain details. Like People should be able to know what information the government has about you, and people should be able to know what the government is doing um, after a certain period of time 
um, has elapsed. Now, there's a few case studies here that I want to talk about in more detail, such as the uh, the MP's expenses scandal and the differences that Freedom of Information has, has made. So we'll save that for another video, but do go and read about it if you don't know about it. But in essence, it means that you and me can find out what the government is doing. And this helps to combat corruption. It helps to combat um, things like bribery. And it also means that you can feel safe and secure knowing what the government knows about you. Lastly, there have been a huge amount of House of Commons reform. Now, the, um, the textbook originally put this into, into a partial success, but I've promoted it to full success in the light of what's been going on, because you cannot look at what's going on with, with Theresa and Brexit and, but now, and now Boris and the House of Commons and not say that the House of Commons is, is not fulfilling um, a huge role. When, and when I was learning politics in the late, in the kind of the, the late, I'm going to say the late 1900s, but it actually was, that's depressing, um, kind of like 98, 99, we had seen the Prime Minister as a power get more powerful and powerful because Thatcher was an incredibly powerful Prime Minister. Blair was an incredibly powerful Prime Minister, arguably because they had these huge majorities in Parliament. But Parliament had basically kind of become the whipping boy. It wasn't doing a lot of analysis. It wasn't doing a lot of uh, checks and balances or holding the government to account. It, it was toothless. But you couldn't say that right now in 2019. It's blocked Theresa's bills on, on multiple occasions. Boris, I think, has now, as of, as of today, lost something like seven out of eight of the votes that he's tried to put through Parliament. Um, it's been suspended and brought back. You know, it's, the House of Commons is alive and kicking. Now, that might be causing lots of problems and it might be stopping Brexit getting through, depending on your view. But certainly the House of Commons has become a force to be reckoned with. And there's also been a load of other reforms that have taken place in the House of Commons that have made it more powerful, such as um, elected heads of select committees, which we'll be talking more about here when we talk about the legislature. Um, we have things like um, um, opposition days, and we've got additional committees such as the Liaison Committee and the Backbench Business Committee, and, and lots of other things that we'll be talking about in the future and learning about in the future. But in short, there have been lots of reforms to help the House of Commons Bring, take, bring the executive to account, to hold them um, accountable for what they're doing and to give them actual tools that they can use to, to overrule the executive in, in some places. So there we go. There's our successes. Now, these are the partial successes or the ones that are kind of on their way or have had some sort of impact, but maybe not complete. And the big one here to talk about is the House of Lords. Now, the House of Lords used to be full, full of what we call hereditary peers which means people who pass their title on from generation to generation. So, hello, I'm Lord Coxie Glassroom, and when I die, my son or my daughter will become either Lord Coxie Glassroom after me and will take my seat in the House of Lords. So this meant that a lot of the members of the House of Lords, if you go back before 1997, were there because their dad was. Um, and they had a, a role to vote and, and create legislation or to block legislation because of a title they had. This is clearly very out of date in a modern democracy and kind of belongs back when you had kind of hereditary kings and queens with huge amounts of power. It's something that came from the past that no brand new democracy would ever kind of write into its constitution that certain people should have hereditary powers. But we still had it and I don't have a voice. So the idea, <coughs> the idea was to get rid of all of these hereditary peers. However, after some wrangling and a bit of compromise, all of them except 92, which is still a fair chunk of them, were abolished. So hundreds and hundreds of them went, but 92 remained. So we do still have this um, hereditary group in the House of Lords. And we also still have Lords Spiritual, which, are, which is a group of um, Church of England bishops that also sit um, in the House of Lords. So there's been partial reform there. But because of this partial reform, nearly all of the House of Lords now, except these 92 and these other kind of bishops, are now appointed. They're called life peers, as in you've done something very deserving. You've given your life to, uh, to, to business or to, to the media or to politics or to music, whatever it is. And we believe you have something to give, something, some sort of expertise that we can use. And you are now a lord for the rest of your life until you die, um, but then that title dies with you. And so the House of Lords has actually become more powerful because it's become more legitimate. It's not as legitimate as an elected house, 
but it's more legitimate than hereditary. And so the House of Lords over the last 10, 15, 20 years, since these reforms, has started flexing its muscles a little bit more, has started to block a few more bills, has started to um, become, to make the news more. And, and so the House of Lords in general, because of these reforms, has started to become a more legitimate part of our political system rather than this antiquated, old-fashioned, undemocratic um, husk. Now, some people think it should go, should go further, um, other people think it's happy, they're happy as it is. So, partial reform. There were plans at various points to make a fully elected second chamber. The Liberal Democrats always wanted that. And when the coalition government came, there was kind of more of a possibility that it might go that way. Um, but it hasn't happened. Um, and so we still have this appointed second chamber with all of its advantages and disadvantages. The Human Rights Act. This was something in 1998, which um, basically enshrines all of your act all of your rights and my rights into one single act it kind of combined lots of the other rights into one gives it gives it clarity and in effect act a bit like the bill of rights in the american constitution now why is this only a partial success well it's a success because it exists it's a success because the supreme court has been ruling it using it to make rulings and in some cases has overruled the government over it and we'll look at those examples in the future such as when it overruled gordon brown in regards to uh, the treatment of terrorist suspects and things like that. Um, but it's not entrenched because we don't entrench things in the UK because we don't have a codified constitution. So the government at any point with a parliamentary majority, so 50% plus one, can overrule any part of the Human Rights Act. So although it exists and it is being enforced, it is not entrenched. So therefore, we're putting it in the some success category. And lastly, thinking back to a previous video, devolution again. Although it's been hugely successful in Scotland and it's had a lot of success in Wales, it's not been successful in Northern Ireland. Stormont is currently not sitting. There's still a question mark over English votes for English um, laws or where is this English parliament. Um, and so you can, there is an argument to be made that devolution has only had some success. And there's this angle that perhaps devolution has increased the chances of the split of the UK. It's given a huge mouthpiece or megaphone to the SNP. And, and you could make an argument that without devolution, you might never have had the independence referendum of 2014, and you might not get these increased calls for a second referendum now, because by just by having that parliament, it gives people like Nicola Sturgeon a platform, big platform, and legitimate platform to say, we want our um, independence. Obviously, it depends which side of these debates you are, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it, it certainly hasn't fulfilled its role of, of, of keeping the UK together, but providing local um, rulings. And what's gone horribly, horribly wrong or just hasn't succeeded at all? Electoral reform. We'll be looking at this in a future um, module, but basically, we, we at the moment, we use a system called first past the post for our general elections. And most people don't like it. Most people think that there are problems with it, but it's here because of traditional reasons and because it benefits the party in power. Like if you are in power, then you like first past the post because you won using that system and every other party doesn't. There were lots of calls to change it. And in particular, the Liberal Democrats in the coalition government wanted to change um, uh, this system, but they failed. We, we held a referendum. You can see here the banner, no to AV. AV stood for the alternative vote. There was a referendum and it was rejected by the British people. So we still have uh, what to blunt is an unfair system um, to elect our general, to elect our MPs at general election. So maybe, so I'm not saying anyway that these failures are bad. I'm saying that they failed to happen. So it's up to you whether this is a good thing or a bad thing that they failed. I'm simply saying that they, they failed to happen. Now, there's one that's been sitting there for a while, which is known as boundary reform. Now, the idea is that our constituencies, where each MP comes from, has roughly equal people living in it. So each MP represents roughly the same amount of people. So it's round about 70,000 people, if I remember correctly. But populations shift. Certain cities and towns are getting bigger. Certain cities and towns are getting smaller. And by and large, we're kind of moving towards the cities and away from the countryside, although that's not necessarily true in all areas. So what this means is, is that the current constituencies, where the boundaries are, hence the term, is kind of wrong. Like, it's not correct anymore. They need to be redrawn. The boundary lines need to be um, 
moved to reflect where populations currently are. Um, and this was proposed and seconded by the Conservative Party, and it was supposed to happen. And, and rumour says that there was actually a deal between Nick Clegg and David Cameron that said that um, David Cameron could have boundary reform if Nick Clegg could have either vote reform or, or House of Lords reform. The idea that these two were going to go together in a kind of electoral reform kind of package. But then the 2015 general election happened and the Conservatives won outright. Nick Clegg and the Lib Dems were gone and this disappeared as well. It's one of the things that perhaps has disappeared in the world of Brexit as well, because there's lots of things that perhaps Theresa May wanted to do that she was never able to do um, because the, her whole world has been taken over by Brexit. And this is probably one of them. Just as a little aside, if they ever do do boundary reform, it will benefit the Conservatives and it will hurt Labour. Um, and, but we'll probably look at this in a, in a, um, in a future video in a bit more detail. Um, Brexit and the PM's powers, I've perhaps already kind of alluded to this, like there is still a lack of clarity over what exactly the, the Prime Minister's powers are, what exactly are what known as prerogative powers, what he can do, what he can't do, such as proroguing Parliament. Um, Brexit itself has thrown up lots of questions as such as um, who can initiate laws, does the Prime Minister have to follow laws, um, can the uh, can, uh, can the executive put the same bill before Parliament multiple times, even if it breaks a work of authority such as Erskine May? And so this whole Brexit thing um, has, has brought into the spotlight lots of the kind of the blurriness of convention and authoritative texts and common laws that have just kind of been away in the background, kind of tinkering away and, and happily kind of worked for the last I don't know, thousand years or 500 years or so. But because Brexit is pushing against the boundaries of convention and people are breaking conventions, there is now a bigger question over whether um, uh, we need to kind of codify our constitution and, and whether there is now a failure of reform because there's a lack of kind of clarity here. I realize that's not a specific example. It's a general observation, but it's probably, probably one that needs to be talked about. And the last one I want to refer to here is the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which I think definitely, which I referred to in detail in a previous video, so I'm not going to go over it um, in huge amounts here. But if you look at constitute the video called Constitutional Reform since 2010, I go over it. But in, in, in short, it was supposed to make sure that elections only happen every five years. But of course, we had one in 2017. We will almost have another one in 2019. Um, it's, it, it's, it worked in that it, it protected the coalition government and gave a stable government for five years between 2010 and 2015. But since then, it, it appears to not be fit for purpose. Or maybe it is, argue, argue it both ways, but it, it's certainly there. So the last topic we need to talk about is a, a big one and it's an important one, which is should we codify the constitution? And you, my friend, my students, are learning about this at a perfect time because there is now, at the moment, there are calls to codify the Constitution. Again, when I was learning about politics, no one was interested in it. Um, but because of what's happened with Boris and proroguing Parliament and Brexit and Parliament passing various bills and, and who's in charge of this and who's in charge of that and is the Speaker blocking this and, you know, whichever side of the argument you are, this lack of clarity of our Constitution is raising issues and it's increasing calls to codify the Constitution. So why should we do it? Well, over the last few hundred years, the executive has slowly got more powerful. They have, been, they have become more dominant. Um, this is not something that's just unique to the UK. It's been seen in America as well. And by codifying a constitution, you are putting the executive in a box called, this is the executive box, this is the legislature box, this is the judicial box, a, a pure separation of powers. We have a fusion of powers. And because of that fusion, it has allowed the executive to get more and more powerful using things like the party whip system or the power of patronage, which we'll talk about in future videos. Um, but codifying the constitution would protect that. It would also entrench the Human Rights Act, which I talked about earlier. It would also give political clarity. So I've been referring throughout this video to the, the kind of the, the vagueness that we have. And it would, it would enshrine exactly what happens and how it works and, and who can do what to whom and what checks and balances exist to kind of present, prevent it. It would safeguard devolution. Um, the Northern Ireland Parliament Assembly is currently not sitting. Um, the GLC back in the 1980s, the Greater London Council, was abolished. 
Um, Scotland could be, the Parliament could be um, abolished, theoretically, because Parliament is sovereign. And so you could actually enshrine devolution, which would make it much closer to being a federal system, which is something I've been talking about in the American politics videos, and it might be worth you having a little look at them to kind of understand those that terminology. But it, it, would, it would create a, a, a protected and entrenched devolved Parliament while, rather than one that exists at the kind of permission of Westminster. And like I said, this is a current issue. And John Burko, the current Speaker of the House of Commons, at least for the next month, said, we've been heading in the direction of a codified constitution for years. And I think that's a lovely little quote that you could use in the essay um, in regards to the Supreme Court, the Bill of Rights, the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, the yada, 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 yada. We have been heading towards a codified constitution. And if you went back to 1997 and said, hey, we should codify the constitution, there'd be an argument to say, no way, there's far too many issues and problems to deal with. Whereas now, it's perhaps a far smaller step or, or a small leap rather than the giant um, kind of bound that would have been needed before. And lastly, I don't know if you can see this past me because I'm not sure where the uh, video is. Yeah, you, you just about can. Um, modern countries have them. Um, we are an old country based on tradition and convention, and maybe to be a truly modern country, we need to modify, modernize our political system um, as well. What about on the other side? Well, one of the beautiful things about an uncodified constitution is it's flexible, it is vague, and it allows the government to be decisive when they need to be and to bend the rules when they need to. Um, and so whether it's whether there's a terrorist attack, whether there's a national security issue, whether there is a bill that needs to be got through, whatever it is, it means that we can change quickly. Um, an example here might be something like gun laws. Um, there was an awful shooting in a, in a Scottish town village called Dunblane uh, in the 1990s, and the government responded by almost instantly changing the laws on gun laws, on handguns, um, in the UK. And it was done in a matter of months and effectively that changed yours and mine rights to have guns and, and weapons in the UK but because um, of the flexibility of the UK constitution it allowed the government to be decisive um, and it mean, and, and think about this all of the constitutional changes that have taken place such as the Supreme Court and the reform of the House of Lords it would have been so much harder to get them through if they had been a, a constitution a codified and entrenched constitution so the flexibility has allowed these changes to happen. And that also increases security. I've mentioned terrorism a few times here. Sometimes the government infringes on your rights to protect the country. And this is a big debate that will never end, but to what extent is the government allowed to invade your privacy, to arrest you without charge, to detain you without charge, to, uh, to deny human rights to terrorist suspects in the, in the broader picture of keeping people safe. Now, I've deliberately kind of put entrenched human rights and security opposite each other here because people tend to be on one side of this argument or the other. They don't, they can sometimes be opposite. But one of the advantages of an uncodified constitution, it means that when the government feels that it is right for security reasons to impinge on human rights, they can. Now, you're probably going, well, that's good or that's terrible, depending on your personal view. But it's certainly an argument you can discuss in the essay. Can we agree on a constitution? It's all very well going, yes, we should have a constitution, but, but what's going to be in that constitution? Who's going to write it? Um, who's going to agree on it? Are we going to have a referendum on it? Is that going to cause problems? Are, are, are we going to have um, constitutioneers or, or unconstitutioneers? Are we then going to have uh, referendums to get rid of it afterwards? Are, uh, is, the, is, the, is the government in power going to write it? Is it going to be a select committee? Is it going to be an independent um, organization that puts it together? Are we going to model it on the American system? Um, What's going to happen to the fusion of powers? Are we going to go to a separation of powers? What's going to happen to the, uh, the queen and things like that? Like, there's just so many questions to be answered and to get agreement on that it could be a big, big job to get it done. We've also seen, and you've seen this just from the last few weeks, that we are heading towards a far more powerful Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not elected. They... Um, there is no real way for you and me to remove uh, members of the Supreme Court. And although it is supposed to be independent, you, not everyone agrees with their rulings. Boris the other day was saying, I respect the court, but I disagree with it. And one of the things about having 
a Bill of Rights and having a Supreme Court and then having a codified constitution, would it would increase the power of the Supreme Court even more. And if you look at America, the members of the Supreme Court are of huge national importance. And if we were to go that down that route, then the third branch of our political system would become far more powerful, a bigger influence on yours and mine life, and would become um, either the protector or the obstacle, depending on your viewpoint, to, to further change. And I've already kind of touched on this, but tradition, convention, monarchy, we are a country that is based, has based its political system around these three things and others. And maybe there's an element to which we don't want to lose these things. Maybe we are conservative with a small C and we kind of like the way that things have gone and, and, and the system just kind of works. Um, which is quite a powerful argument, you know, the whole, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, if, if it's been working on tradition and convention with this kind of constitutional monarchy that in theory has powers, but in reality doesn't actually use them and, and, all, and all sorts. And I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But maybe the argument is that because of Brexit, it's broke. That's down to you and that's down to your arguments. But there's certainly loads of things to talk about here. Um, and I think... I mean, I'd love this kind of question to come up in the exam. I don't know about you, but it, it's a straightforward question where there's loads to talk about. There's loads of examples. You just need to pick a side and, and, and go with it. So what kind of things should happen? Sorry, I should have changed the title here to kind of like possible essays. These are the kind of essays that could come up that would involve these kind of topics. So let's look through them. Evaluate the case for introducing a UK constitution, basically the previous slide. Evaluate the success of constitutional reform since 1997 to 2010. So you'd have to look at individual bits and talk about how well they've worked and well they haven't. But you would need an overall kind of argument flow to the essay. You know, have they overall been good, overall been bad? I would probably argue, if I was writing the essay, that overall they've made the system more democratic, more responsible. They've brought in certain rights, but maybe they haven't gone far enough yet, or maybe they've, uh, or maybe it's led to Parliament frustrating the executive or something like that. But I, I'd probably argue that it's been successful with exceptions. Evaluate the extent to which rights are effectively protected by the UK constitution. We'll be looking at the judiciary and the legislature later, um, but you should be able to have a good stab at that um, question now by talking about things like entrenched and some certain examples like things like the, the Bill of Rights and so on. Um, you probably wouldn't be able to get an A yet, but at the moment you'd certainly be able to get a good quality uh, B, C grade on that essay, and we'll add in examples in the future. And lastly, evaluate the extent to which the UK is effectively a federal system. Um, once you get to American politics, you'll have a far better understanding of that, but you should be able to have a good uh, discussion now about the extent to which our devolved parliaments are, are federal. And of course, there's other questions as well they can bring in, but this gives you the kind of things that will be. Hope you find that useful. Take some notes, speak to your teachers if you've got any questions about it. Um, have a look at the textbooks, do some independent learning, and I'll see you soon. Take care, bye-bye.